it out. Brand new. Yeah, welcome again, everyone, to Crossroads. Brand new. And if you weren't here last week, we said it's all about the colon. The colon in the title makes a big difference because it's not just brand new stuff that we're talking about. It's a new brand. And we're not talking about cereal or clothing or athletic wear or something like that. We're talking about the brand that the church has become known for. In, in other words, what are the values and the meanings, what does the church represent to people in our culture? And last week, uh, I suggested that the problem is, in our day, a, a lot of the things that the church has become known for were the very things that Jesus came to put an end to, and instead of the things that Jesus came to put a beginning to, that, that our brand has become off-brand. And especially in terms of what Jesus had in mind. So this series, Brand New, we're asking the question, how can we become the church that Jesus envisioned us to be? And so if you weren't here last week, a brief recap. We talked about old and new. We talked about what was the old that Jesus came to replace. And we gave the title to the old, the temple model. Not because it only applies to religions that have temples, but because it's, it's a title that it, it includes almost every ancient religion and many, many current religions that have these three concepts in common. First, there's a sacred place. We said it doesn't matter whether it's big or small or grandiose or very plain, that there's some holy ground that you are supposed to go to that has the presence of God there. And secondly, there are holy people who are in charge of the holy place. So these these sacred people, most of the time they're men, they are in charge of the sacred place. And number three, there's usually a sacred text. And so the sacred people at the sacred place interpret the sacred text and they tell all the people how they're supposed to live. That's the old that Jesus came to put an end to, and the new that Jesus came to begin was the gospel model. Uh, the, the gospel model was to change the entire approach to religion. It was not temple model 2.0. It was something, well, something brand new, and it wouldn't be based around a sacred place. In fact, in the gospel, we're told that we are all temples of the Lord, that you don't have to go to any sacred place to be in God's presence, that in fact God takes up residence within each one of us. The, the new covenant, the new arrangement of how we relate to God would be based on the resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, there would be a new law. That It wasn't 630 laws or even 10. It was just one. Jesus said, I give you a new command, love one another as I have loved you. So it wasn't just a tweak on what had come before. Jesus came and said, I'm starting something brand new. And this new thing was irresistible for a lot of reasons, but primarily because they loved so well. They put into practice the thing that Jesus said 
that this new thing would be known for was how much they loved one another. And so we ended last week by saying, and it changed the world. It, it's simply a historical fact that the Christian faith went from 120 or so people immediately after the resurrection of Jesus to in the next 200 years being named the official Roman religion with no power, no money, no political uh, affiliation, no military might. And, And so the reason for this was because this thing, this new thing that Jesus had created was just simply irresistible. And so last week was sort of an encouraging, uh, you know, ended on a who wouldn't want to be a part of a church like that. This week's going to be more challenging, a little more like stir the pot in your face. In fact, some of you are going to have problems with what I say today, which is fine because I, it, we have to take the next step in saying, well, well, what happened then? If, if Jesus had this brand new invention in mind, what happened And the story begins actually with what we call this new thing. The new thing that Jesus started would become known as the church, but not originally. In fact, look at this scripture from Matthew chapter 16. One of the first places that Jesus is quoted as using the word the church is in Matthew 16. When after after Jesus, after Peter has this great confession of understanding who Jesus is, You are the Savior. Jesus says, you're right. God told you that because you didn't come up with that on your own, buddy. And I'm going to build my, what does it say, church. But the word that Jesus says there, some of you may have heard this word before, in Greek is ekklesia. Let me hear you say ekklesia. You all sound like Greek scholars. Very good. And and that word um, means literally a gathering. A, a congregation of people has nothing to do with a place. I say, well, where did the word church then come from? Well, the word church was a German word that meant house of the Lord. And so when the New Testament was translated into English, somebody, one of the sacred people at the sacred place who was in charge of the sacred text, decided that they were going to use this word kirch from German that meant the house of the Lord. And therein lies the rub. That from the beginning of the process until now, the old is harder to let go of than you would imagine. (laughs) It has a tendency to keep creeping back in to the new. And actually, even the, the very first English translation Uh, William Tyndale was famously uh, persecuted because he refused to put that word church in. He he wanted, he used the word congregation because he knew that it's not like that. It's brand new. And so herein lies the tension that we're going to wrestle with today. Instead of brand new, the church too often and I would suggest certainly in our day, has been a mixture of the new and the old. And so much time has passed from the brand new vision that Jesus gave that most of us don't think there's anything wrong with it anymore, this mixture idea. And I understand that because some mixtures are good, aren't they? Think of things that you mix together and it just makes them Better, like coffee and cream. They mix together, and for many of you, it'd say it makes it better. I, I don't drink black coffee. I only drink it when it's mixed with, with the cream. Uh, chocolate and milk. You mix it together, chocolate milk. Some people, they don't, don't like it unless it's chocolate milk. But then there are some things, right, that don't mix at all, like oil and, and water. You try to mix oil and water, and they don't. Don't mix at all. You can pour one on the other and they just stay separate. They don't mix very well. And I thought that was the illustration I was going to give you for how this old and new come about. But that's not exactly it. It's more like things that you can mix together, but it ruins both of them. 
It's, it's more like adding sugar to your gasoline in your car. Like, you can do that. Those two things will mix together, but it ruins both of them. You have two things that are, play a role that, that are good on their own, but when you mix them together, it ruins them both. That's what it's like when we take the old, the temple model, and the new, the gospel model, and we try to mix them together. It messes up both things. Are we saying that the old thing was bad? No. In fact, the Apostle Paul that we're going to talk about today, he had to answer that question because you could easily misconstrue what he was saying to say that was all bad. It wasn't all bad. He says in the book of Romans, so is the law sin? By no means. But added to this brand new thing that Jesus came to establish, it messes both things up. So mixing the old temple model with the new gospel model doesn't work. And let's think about why. It's because uh, the, the temple model, let's think of, of all the things that encompassed that, was focused on moral reformation and uh, behavior modification. In other words, the point was uh, you should avoid these actions and you should add these actions in order to live a life that's pleasing to God. That, that sort of captures the point of the old model. But the gospel model says something completely different. It's not focused on behavior modification. It's focused on heart transformation. It's focused on something completely different. Now, one might produce the other, but they are completely separate things. So the point is not to add this action or avoid that action. The point, actually, of the gospel model is to become a different kind of person that tends to avoid or add these types of actions. It's not external. It's internal. It's not mechanical. It's organic. C.S. Lewis um, says it a lot better than and probably I could say. And so um, in his Mere Christianity book, he, he talks about niceness. And I love this. He says, niceness is an excellent thing. We must try by every means in our power to produce a world where as many people as possible grow up nice, just as we must try to produce a world where we all have plenty to eat. Make sense? Yeah, more nice people better. But, he says, we must not suppose that even if we succeed in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, listen to this, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world and might even be more difficult to save. For mere improvement is not redemption, though redemption always improves people, even here and now, and will in the end improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. He gives an illustration of God didn't come and uh, try to get a bunch of horses to be able to jump better. He came to turn a bunch of horses into winged creatures. Now, do winged creatures go over the jumps better? Well, yeah, they do. But that's not the point. Uh, and, and so in the same sense, it's easy to misconstrue these two, but they are different things. The old temple model and the new gospel model. And so one of the first people to address this issue was the Apostle Paul. And you've already heard a little bit of a letter that he wrote to these churches in Galatia. Now, he wasn't always the Apostle Paul. Some of you know he started his life as a guy named Saul. And Saul was an expert in, and in many ways, a product of the temple model. He was a Pharisee. He was really good at the temple model. And he sort of had given his life to protecting anything that would, uh, th that would threaten the temple model. And so he was, as the new thing began to be birthed, 
he was given his life to stopping the ecclesia, stopping the gathering in Jesus' name, because it was threatening the temple model, of which he was a product and an expert. And so Saul has an encounter with God. You can read about it in the book of Acts. It's fascinating. Gets knocked off his horse, literally, and, and meets the living God. And when, you, when that happens to you, it changes you. It doesn't uh, give you a new set of rules. I'm going to try to avoid this or try to add this. It actually just changed him. And he became a different kind of person. Not all at once, over time. And he got a new name. His new name was Paul. And he wrote half the New Testament. And he wrote to this group of churches that he started on one of his first missionary trips. He would go around and and be a, a proponent of this new brand, this completely different way of doing religion. And so he started church, then he would go on to the, the next region. And the region of Galatia was a, one of the first that he started churches in. And after he had left, there were some folks who came in, some other teachers, and they began to say, well, no, no, no. What he said wasn't wrong. It was just you didn't get it all. And they took some of the old and added it in to the new. And so basically, they were telling these people in Galatia that in order to be a part of this new thing, you also have to become Jewish, which could make total sense, right? I mean, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, He was called the Messiah. That was a Jewish thing, the Old Testament prophets that said that there's a Messiah coming. They were all Jewish. And so it was very reasonable to say, well, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you also have to become Jewish. Now, that that was in many ways a bigger deal than it might sound. For the men, at least, it required some surgery, (laughs) which talk about a high bar for membership, you know. If we think that there are people, we have a high bar. You think, well, yeah, you have to believe this and you have to say this, but you also have to have some surgery. Who's going to sign up? And so that's what's happening. And Paul hears about it, the Apostle Paul, and he kind of says, oh, well, that's no big deal. No. no. (laughs) In fact, that's exactly the opposite of what he said. He flips out. He he just blows his, he goes ballistic. And you didn't hear it that way probably when we read the scripture earlier because you didn't have the context of what he was really talking about. So let's go back to that scripture in Galatians chapter 5. And let me show you the intensity in which the Apostle Paul um, recoils against this mixture of the old and the new. Starting in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 5, where he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Which makes me wonder, well, what's the alternative? (laughs) Why would you say that? Unless there was a belief in something besides that. What else for freedom would someone set you free for? Well, the, the opposite of freedom would be, would be bondage, would be slavery, would be oppression. So, so go with me here. The Apostle Paul is saying, hold on. Somebody has told you and you have believed this message that Jesus has set you free, not to be free, but to just be in bondage to something else. And he's saying, that's crazy. That's not what's happened. And and so uh, the Apostle Paul says that it's not for anything besides freedom. And he he makes this distinction. Jesus has accomplished your freedom. And then he says three times in the next three verses, but don't let yourself, but you don't let yourself, don't let yourself. So Jesus did his thing. But then you have the opportunity to mess it up. <laughs> you have the opportunity to, uh, to not live in the freedom that Jesus has offered you. And, and so he would basically say this. Look, Christ set you free 
which means uh, live the life that you owe, died the death that you deserve, so that you don't get what you deserve, you get what he deserves. Freedom. So Christ has set you free. If you're burdened by religious demands, that's on you. And he, he wants to point out how crazy that is and, and how completely ulterior it is to what Jesus preached and had in mind. And so I would say to you, if your version of Christianity does not produce freedom in you, you got the wrong one. And it is a big deal. It's not, oh, well, um, everybody's different. It's a big deal. So in verse 2, Paul says, mark my words. And there's no exclamation points in the Greek language. But, I, <laughs> but they, they put it in there because you could tell that he's cranked up at this point. Mark my words. And then he reminds them who he is. I, Paul, like they forgot, you know, who was writing the letter or, or something like this. Um, mark my words. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. <laughs> what is he saying? He's saying, if you try to mix the old with the new, the new won't do you any good. It will be two things that maybe they're both okay on their own, but when you mix them together, they ruin everything. Verse 3, he says, every man. Now, sometimes in the scripture uh, where there's gender neutrality, uh, translators have missed that. And in our day, a lot of translations have gone back and, and tried to include that and everything. This is one of the places where it is not gender neutral, what Paul is about to say here. And you'll see why in just a second. He says, every man that goes and gets circumcised is not a part of this new thing that Jesus was doing. But let's be clear. Let's be really clear. What's, he, what's the problem? Is the problem circumcision? Even saying that word so many times is making some of you uncomfortable. It, it is not the problem, right? Circumcision is not, not the problem. Paul was raised a Jewish boy. He was circumcised. Most, if not all, of the disciples of Jesus were circumcised. Many of you are circumcised. In fact, raise your hand. In the, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> Just, just kidding. Um, I should have let that one hang a little bit more. People were like, oh, I don't know. Uh, circumcision is not the problem. Circumcision here is representing the temple model. It's representing the old way that Jesus came and said is, is over. And so Paul was clear. He's not against the, uh, the act of circumcision. He was just saying that circumcision is taking part of this old and trying to mix it with the new. And he says, if you take any of it, you got to take all of it. At the end of verse 3, he says, if you do that, then you're obligated to the entire thing. So if that's what you want to sign up for, then just go do the old thing. But it's got nothing to do with the new thing. And what are the consequences? Look at verse 4. He says, so if you do... You who are trying to be justified by the law, you've been alienated from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. Which sounds rather extreme, doesn't it? I mean, it's just a little mixture. And he says, if you do that, you've been alienated from Christ. Why? Because if you add the law to grace, you get all law and no grace. Do you get that? It, the, the gospel is based on the grace of God. Grace is God knew everything about you and decided to love you anyway. Grace is God gives you exactly what you do not deserve and could never earn. Grace is, is this gift from God. And the moment that you try, you try, you start trying to earn it, it becomes something else and it doesn't work anymore. Andy Stanley has this illustration that I, I, I like about this particular interaction. And he says, um, you know, imagine, if you will, that, that one of you after the service um, wants to show some kind of appreciation to me, um, which will be fine, by the way. Uh, and you came up and you gave me a, a gift card for a, a restaurant. I could name the restaurant, but that would 
seem to be not necessary. But anyway, you gave me, let's say it's a $100 gift card. And, and I looked at you and I said, wow, I, 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 it's so nice of you, but I can't let you, you do this. I, I, must, I need to pay you for it. And you go, well, no, it's, that, it's a gift. Um, you can't pay me for it because then it wouldn't be a gift. And I go, oh, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. How about if I just give you 50 bucks for it? And then it can still be a gift, but then it doesn't, you know. And they're like, no, you're missing the point here. It, I go, okay, 25. And you go, okay, 25 sounds fine. No, whatever. It, when I pay you something for it, it becomes something else besides a gift. And grace is never anything but a gift. So it doesn't matter if you're trying to mix, your mixture is 80-20 or 90-10, it ends up being 100 and zero. <laughs> because it's not a gift anymore when you start trying to earn it. And so, Paul gets to this verse 6 sort of conclusion. So if you've tuned out, tune back in right now. Be- because this is the point in where I-, I-, I think some of you have avoided church for years uh, because the church didn't get this right. Some of you um, have been attending church for years and you would swear to me that this is not in the Bible. So this is where Paul draws this conclusion in verse 6. He says, In Christ, circumcision or uncircumcision hasn't, doesn't have any value. We've covered that. And then he says this line, The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. (laughs) Let me read it again. The only thing that matters, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And probably you're thinking, and probably they were um, thinking and discussing as they read this letter, Well, I mean, sure, but you don't mean like the only thing. I mean, so certainly you mean like, I mean, there's a lot of things in the Bible that it says. And and so clearly you you mean like one of the things among all the things. No, the only thing, he says. Well, I I mean, you you don't mean the, this is the only, Paul, how many things count? One. What's the, th- the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself. That word is working, um, energizing, um, working itself out. Is faith working out its actions through love, active love for other people. The Apostle Paul says, the new is all about this. And, and so do you see what a big deal this is? The, the temple model often, um, almost exclusively, refers to me and God, vertical. And, and so you go through, um, God, um, I didn't, and I, uh, I promise, and are we good? And God, I won't. Oops, I did. I, will you forgive me? Amen. Are we good? Are we good? God, are we good? All vertical. And the gospel model is about not you at all. (laughs) It's about the life that Jesus lived, and he's good. (laughs) And the death that he died, so that you're good. And so you'll never have to, if you have placed your faith in the work of Jesus on the cross, Never have to lay your head down at night wondering, God, are we good? It's almost like God's like, stop asking. <laughs> we're good, okay? <laughs> we're good. Don't have anything to do with you, but we're good. Now, will you move on and be about the one thing that matters? You've, you've muddied the water so often. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. And you'd say, well, don't you think we're being a little over dramatic here? <laughs> I mean, probably it's an exaggeration to make the point. Yeah? 
like uh, lots of things matter, and you take some of this and some of that one, and that's okay. Everybody's a little different. And the Apostle Paul says, no, no, I'm not kidding. This is over. This is us. And so if you want to be a part of this, don't pull any of that stuff back in here. It's all grace or it's no grace. Which one do you want? To make the point, and and I'll last verse I'll read again is this one. This is the R-rated section uh, of the program this morning. Take the children out of the room. It, because in you think he's cranked up before. In verse 12, he keeps talking and, and he draws this conclusion. He says, as for those agitators, <laughs> the people who are saying, well, you have to become Jewish before you can be a follower of Jesus. As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's in the Bible. You should read your Bible. <laughs> he says, you want to do, do some cutting? Well, just keep cutting. Because <laughs> you can't cut enough. <laughs> he says, I wish they would hurt themselves. That's weird. What? It's not that big of a deal. It is a huge deal. Why? Because Paul could see the implications. Because Paul understood, because he was an expert in the old. And he said, you know, if we still hang on to some of the old, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Leaders are going to become self-righteous. I've seen it. I know how this game works. And, and people are, are going to become hypocritical. They're not going to be able to be honest with one another or even themselves. And then the texts are going to be manipulated. If we don't get this right, people will be mistreated in the name of this sacred thing that's supposed to be about faith expressing itself in love. I can see it. That's why it's such a big deal. I told you I was going to stir the pot right? And what I want us to do is do some introspection and say, God, we, we want to be the new brand, the, the, the brand that you intended on at the beginning. Help us to let go of what's holding us back. We're holding on to some things that are holding us back. God, help us to let go of those things. Um, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and uh, we're going to close with uh, this version of a, a really familiar old hymn, Amazing Grace. And, and I love that we picked this song to close on this week. Um, there's a lot of different ways to um, draw conclusions around this song, but as I was thinking about closing off this message, I thought, you know, um, there's an old, uh, a book that was written years ago, years ago called What's So Amazing About Grace. Really cool book. Philip Yancey uh, wrote it. Um, I would recommend it. But I, one of the things he doesn't say, not straightforward in any way in that book, that I thought as an answer to that question at the end of this message is, what's so amazing about grace is that we keep trying to add something to it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> we keep trying to add something else to grace, and it messes it up every time. So maybe, maybe this morning as we close, you might just say, amazing grace. I'm not going to add anything else to it. And we as a church would take a small step towards being the thing that Jesus envisioned, the gathering that he started all the way back at the beginning. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for uh, this clear picture and the, the emotion and intensity of Paul's letter that still resonates today. Uh, I pray that it would stir our hearts, that it would cause us to, to take a really close look at, are there things that we're holding on to that are holding your church back? We want to let them go. Amazing grace. Would you pour it over every one of us this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.